I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker today, who is uh, uh, Rebecca Killick. And uh, Rebecca is a professor of statistics at Lancaster University. Um, they are a council member for the European Network for Business and Industrial Statistics, a member of the um, Royal Statistical Society Data Science Task Force, secretary for the ISS Statistical Computing Section, and on numerous advisory and editorial boards. Rebecca's research involves uh, developing statistical models and methods, particularly in relation to time series, um, which includes change point analysis and multi-scale methods such as uh, wavelets. Rebecca also works with businesses and organizations to help solve statistical problems that arise in practice in business, environmental, and health applications. So, um, so thanks. Thank you very much, Emma, for that um, long introduction. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you very much for um, the invitation. I'm going to start with a um, shameless plug. Um, so at Lancaster, we've always been um, a pure mathematics and statistics department, um, but we recently got one of the E3 Expanding Excellence in, in England bids, um, which is allowing us to um, spread out into applied math. And so there's a large range of different backgrounds here, so I wanted to kind of advertise this. Um, so we're, it's called Mars, so it's Mathematics for AI and Real World Systems. Um, the idea is it's at the interface between applied maths um, and AI, and obviously it will link into both the pure uh, the pure math section and the statistics section. So we're hiring a very broad range of people here. So people that are on the more theoretical side, so more leaning toward pure maths and um, side of applied uh, math research, as well as onto the more um, AI side. And we're hoping that this group is going to kind of join um, a lot of things together to be able to kind of do um, modern applied maths um, in this world where we have all of this AI and, and the other um, aspects of modern um, computing. So we have 10 new academic positions and the, we will be hiring all ranks. We've had three uh, lecturers already and there'll be open ranks opening in the next few days. So if you know anybody who is interested right the way through um, from their first lectureship all the way through to full professor, um, please do let them know. Um, and once we have had got them actually in place, our first one start, um, well, we've had one person start already and two others start in January. So we'll, we'll then have advertisements for research fellows, postdocs and PhD students. So yeah, please let us know um, if there's anything. Um, specifically uh, relevant for today, um, we have an environment stream um, for Mars, but we also have health, cybersecurity and engineering as kind of our target areas. Um, but people don't have to be already working in one of those. They just have to be interested in in um, some type of application of the math. So I think it's very pertinent for the um, IMA today. Uh, so with that plug, um, I'll move on to, I think I'll go forward, no, thank you. Um, so my research, I, I'm firmly in, in the wheelhouse of the IMA. I don't do anything in maths. I don't develop anything without an application in mind. So. Generally speaking, I'm interested in developing new uh, mathematics for analyzing data. Um, I'm a statistician, so I tend to focus on the statistical properties of um, certain data streams and how they change over time. So that could be that it's abrupt changes that we might see in terms of tipping points and things in the climate, uh, station moves, things like that, or it could be gradual changes that might be indicative of um, you know, a slowly varying climate um, or, or other aspects around that. But what does that actually mean in practice? I can say that that's what I do, but what does that actually look like? So I don't just work in environmental aspects, I actually work across a broad um, spectrum of different application areas. And um, generally, um, I'm the person who goes, oh, shiny new thing. That's a nice shiny new application that I, I want to kind of look at. Um, and it's taken me across a variety of different things, um, but I have been, um, working in environment um, for, for my whole career. I started off with my um, uh, master's project where I was looking at um, environmental processes and winds and wave heights and things. So I've kind of been there all the way through and then added the other stuff as, as I've had interest. But I don't do that in silo. So I always work with somebody who has this substantive application. And I think that's one of the key things that I want to kind of take away from my talk today 
and I hope the other speakers um, later in, in this um, sessions are going to also talk about, it's not just mathematicians by themselves. Right? It's not just us thinking, oh, that looks like an interesting data set. I'm just going to go and ferret around with that for a bit. We are working with the actual people that own the data, that have those research questions. And for me, that is the key. I can't develop some new maths. I'm not motivated purely by the mathematics. I'm motivated by the research questions that people have and working with them to be able to solve them. So that kind of involves a wide range of people and these are just some of uh, my collaborators um, over the last kind of 10 plus years. One of the things that kind of motivates me, particularly in the environmental sciences, is the challenges that come with people understanding that they need mathematics, but not necessarily understanding how to use the mathematics. Right? And I think this is a large part of why collaborations are really, really important. But this is an example here of several different things that I've seen um, in the environmental literature of kind of standard mistakes. Um, I have a, a recent paper in the Journal of Climate, which is common mistakes and pitfalls um, in, in, um, in change point analysis for, for these sorts of climate data sets. So the first one A there is, is you have a mean shift. So you have a change in mean at some point and they go, okay, I'm just gonna fit a linear model to it and they just fit a line to it. So that's not appropriate. Then you get the people that go, oh, I know a bit about how things change over time. And so you get B where they go, I'm gonna fit some mean shifts to this data when really it should just be a trend. And that's a, a kind of a standard one of people maybe um, wanting to identify some changes to give them some meaning and to be able to say something about their data rather than just it's increasing over time. And then all of that is kind of fine when you're looking at just independent data, but actually the next kind of level is that there's normally some kind of dependent structure within a lot of the data sets that I encounter, especially in the increasing sensification where there's this drive within the environmental sciences to get data at a finer granularity over time and space, and that dependent structure that might not have been there previously suddenly appears. Okay? And people are not used to dealing with that. They're used to their tried and standard techniques, the stuff that they've been taught um, in their undergraduates and, and by um, people who also have, don't have a statistics or mathematical background. Okay? So C and D here are things that you can do when maybe you have correlation in your data and people are either fitting decreasing trends when really it's just a flat structure or they're fitting changes in mean when, when in reality, again, it's just it's just odd correlated noise. That's gonna be important in, in some of my examples that I talk about today. And then there are some people who actually go, oh, I've heard about autocorrelation, I'm going to fit an autocorrelated time series. And so they, they get E here, which is where a bit like uh, the mistake in B, they've heard about something that's more sophisticated. They don't quite understand it completely. They don't quite understand how to check whether what you've done is, is the right thing to do. So it's all this like model checking side of things. And so they fit an autocorrelated time series when in reality, there's complete independence and it's just a change in mean. And one of the most interesting things that, that I find with, uh, I'll talk about what change points are in, in a minute, but in my field, you can have just a simple mean shift uh, part of the data. And if you're not careful, the standard diagnostics that you might use will tell you that you have a long memory time series. And in reality, you do not. So I find it very interesting that some very simple departures from um, standard mathematical models can actually introduce very complex model structures or might look like they're complex model structures. And sometimes you just have to engage your brain a little bit, do some diagnostics and actually look at the data. I think with a lot of these things, if you look at the data, you, you actually see that maybe it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So I've worked in a, a wide variety of different areas in environmental sciences. I'm not an expert in any of these by far, but the thing that I really love about mathematics is that it gets you to work with different people 
and learn little things about different areas. It's the whole reason I got into, into maths in the first place. I couldn't choose what I wanted to do because I wanted to do a little bit of everything. And that's what maths allows you to do. And I absolutely love it. So I've worked in all of these different um, environmental science areas with some amazing people, uh, different groups across the world. Um, and just learning, sometimes you've never even met the person. It's always, you know, maybe being online um, or um, email conversations when, when it was um, harder to meet online. So I'm not gonna talk about all of these today, um, but as I said, I'm not an expert in any of them, but the maths that I'm using is the same in all of these different areas. And I think that's wonderful. Um, so that's just a... So one of the reasons why I like working in environmental sciences, and I'm frustrated working in environmental sciences, um, is the kind of press and the, the kind of politics side we, we heard earlier um, from, the, from the, um, the IMO speaker about the politics behind climate. So I get very frustrated because you get editorials like this that appear in prominent newspapers and um, different uh, media outlets or social media sort of things. And my question is, where is the statistics or where is the maths? Okay. Because they're saying climate change is speeding up and things like that. And all they're doing is that they're having some data like this and they're going, oh, let me pick by eye a point and I'm going to compare before and after, and I'm going to do some statistical test, which just is a difference in two groups. And I'm going to claim that that is, that is my good statistics. I'm going to claim that, that that is the best thing that I can do for this data. So this is one example here. There are many, many out there. And most of the time, they don't even, they're not even as good as this. At least here, we've, we've got a, a kind of a, a, an error bound on, on the warming rates. Most of the time, what climate scientists are doing, and not all of them, I should say, there are some very, very good climate scientists out there, um, but they don't tend to get the, the same press because they're not in the, you know, going to one extreme or the other extreme. They're very measured because that's what maths actually, I think, does for this. It, it, pre it presents a measured solution. So it's never going to be the, the big sexy, oh, this is this is a, an increased warming rate. Okay. So I was working on this is so this is the exact same data, and I was working on this data back in um, 2017. So this is published in Journal of Climate with um, Claudia Boyo, uh, who's now at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and we were working on this data because Claudia uh, is um, I think she would say an environmental statistician. She's one of those lovely people who to a statistician is not a statistician and to an environmental scientist is not an environmental scientist. <laughs> and I absolutely love those people because they are the translators between everything. Um, and so she came to me, we were having a discussion um, actually at the Isaac Newton um, Institute in Cambridge. Um, and we were having a discussion and she said, people are saying there's a hiatus. People are saying global warming is slowing down. And so it's right at the end here, they're saying, oh, it's slowing down because we've, we've got a few data points that, that look as if they might be flat. And then, you know, that was back in 2017, fast forward to 2023, and currently they're using exactly the same data to be able to say, it's speeding up. <laughs> and so I get very frustrated. <laughs> Um, and so part of this is, um, so this is a, a new um, paper that's coming out in Communications, Earth and Environment. It's again with Claudie, and it's also with Colin Gallagher, uh, Robert Lund and uh, Yuheng Shi, uh, all from the US. Um, and we, we basically just got a bit fed up. <laughs> and so what we did, um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what we did a bit later, actually. Um, but this is kind of one motivation for why I think maths is really, really important, because otherwise you can be using the data to say two different things, complete opposites, um, with just a couple of years apart, because it's suddenly we've got this one extra data point that goes up and suddenly, suddenly we have a trend instead of a flat. Um, this is some of the data that I feel is very important. So I was saying before about how we get increases um, in the temporal um, setting. 
So this is some data from, from a new sensor attached to um, a tree, looking at how, I find it fascinating, honestly, I could talk to you about this for ages, um, about how trees take um, water from the ground and use it. So how the sap from the tree basically flows up from the water, flows up from the bottom out into the rest of the tree. And so you could attach a sensor to the tree that measures this flow. And I find it incredible. And so we're measuring how trees grow, okay? And so this is um, data from a specific species. Again, this is a, a, current prep, a paper that's in preparation with um, Andy Hirons is, is the main author. So he's a, a arbologist uh, from Mindsco College up um, near Preston. Uh, and we're basically getting, this is how trees grow. I find it absolutely incredible. So you can see at night that, that they don't grow very much and during the day they grow more and you've got cloudy days when they don't grow as much and sunny days when they, when they grow more. And so Andrew did a lovely experiment where he was looking, he wanted to kind of see how tolerant trees were to certain aspects of their environment. Very important question when, we, when we're talking about how our climate might be changing over time and what might be the best species to plant in certain places. Um, so what, what Andy did was, this is uh, the beginning, the pink part at the beginning, that's our kind of control setting. Then this blue part here, the trees were completely submerged in water. So they, they had no um, access to oxygen whatsoever from the root system, uh, only from, from the leaves. Uh, and so this is the, the kind of, we call it the water logging period. And then afterwards here, this is, this is the kind of post experiment. We wanna see how they respond. So we've got um, black here is um, our control species. So they weren't put in, in the water and red is the um, species that were put into water. Landy came to me, um, we actually got connected through, through a, mutual, um, a mutual friend um, and he came to me and he said, wait, you do tiny things, don't you? He's like, in my field, all we ever do is we collect data at certain points. We might have a data point at the beginning, a data point part way through, and a data point at the end. We maybe usually have three or four observations, but I've got these cool new sensors and they give me data. Uh, this one's every 10 minutes. So I get data every 10 minutes and it's just incredible, but I don't know what to do with it because my usual technique is to take my, you know, my pre and my post, take a difference, take the difference between the treatment and control and do a t-test. And that's what I normally do. But I did that here and I got no, no difference, but I can see it. I can see there's a difference here in the peaks. And you said, I was really disappointed because I thought I was going to be able to get statistical difference here and, and I can't. And I was like, yeah, Andy, but you've got all of this time at night when there's no difference at all. And you've got all of this time over here where there's no difference at all and you're averaging it over all of that. And so if you look at this bottom employer, this is the, the difference between the, the two uh, on the top. And you can kind of see that, you know, that all of the bits above and all of the bits below are going to kind of cancel out over time. But that's not telling the story. But he just didn't have the, have the um, he, had, he understood that he needed something else, but he had no idea what it was. And it was really lucky that we kind of got, got um, introduced to each other to be able to look at this data together. Um, so typically what people might do is uh, in this field, there's not really any, any um, good studies in this field so far. People are just playing around with these, with these sorts of sensors. And so what they've done is they've said, okay, well, what, when, when it's dark, that's all of these green measurements here. When it's dark, we're gonna just disclude the data and that's gonna fix it for us because that's gonna take out all the nighttime period. But what we can kind of see here is it, it doesn't because they take some time to kind of get going in the morning. Who thought trees needed time to wake up? That's <laughs> just incredible, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to tell you in it a little bit once I've told you about the methods that I'm going to be using, but I'm going to use exactly the same method for both of these applications, despite being completely different, um, different research questions. They're all interested in change over time. And that's kind of what comes through. So I'm going to tell you a bit about what that, what that is now. Now you've heard me rabbit on about, about some actual applications, let's get to some maths. So I work in change. As I said, it could be abrupt or it could be slowly varying. I'm going to talk to you about abrupt change today um, just because trying to cover both in one talk is, is too much. 
Um, and so when I'm talking about change, I'm going to say that I have some data. And if there is a change at tau, then before tau and after tau are different in some way. Okay. And if, if you're not a statistician and, and you're um, maybe into applied maths, you can think about differences in entropy and, and the differences in terms of the mechanics of what actually happens in the process either side, but there's going to be some difference. So this first one here is a mean difference. So whether the, the um, kind of mean value here, the average is changing over time. And so we'd have three change points and it's just where, where this um, line goes up. Okay. But a change in variability in the middle where you can clearly see you've got small variability, larger, then it goes smaller and larger again. And then this is a trend, but the trend doesn't have to join. Okay, I'll talk a bit later about joining trends, but this one doesn't, doesn't have to join. And so when I talk about change, I'm thinking about this sort of thing. So if you're not sure what to think about when through my talk, this is kind of the nice one I always picture in my head um, whenever I'm talking, just, just the mean shift. So you might know about change points under another name. Um, so breakpoints, segmentation, structural breaks, regime switching, detecting disorder, these are all kind of the same thing. Um, and so if you know about any of those, I'm talking about that. Okay? And they're useful in a wide variety of different settings. Um, one of my favorite ones was linguistics when we were looking at accents and how people respond to accents. I thought that was a nice, neat application of these. Um, but how do we actually construct this mathematically? So I'm going to have a running example, which is, is just this mean shift because it's very conceptually easy for us to, to understand. And all we're saying is that every single data point is going to have a different distribution. That's my yt here. But I'm going to fix um, my theta t, which is the mean here. It's going to be the same for all of these values in this segment. Uh, same for all of these, same for all of these, and same for all of these. But the dip, the um, value theta t at um, uh, 50 here is going to be different from the value of theta t at 150. So there's a piecewise constant through time. Okay. And if it's not a mean shift, if it's an, any other way of characterizing your data, any type of model you want to do, you can do the same thing where you just say, okay, we're going to have one model for the first part, one model for the second part, etc. And that's exactly what we do. Okay. So there are many different ways that you can characterize change points, but one of the simplest things to do is just to say that my model for my whole data is just going to be the model <coughs> restricted to this part of the data, model two restricted to this part, model three restricted to this part, model four restricted to this part. Nice, simple breakaway from um, the assumption of one model for the whole data. But whilst that's nice and simple, actually being able to fit these sorts of models is not because you have questions such as, well, how many changes do I have in my data? Where are those changes? And if you don't know the um, where and how number, then there are two to the n minus one possible solutions for, for data of length n. So a simple model here can come into, into uh, complications fairly quickly. But the advantage of this model is that you can say, okay, well, if I know my data and I know you know, what model I would use here, then all of the tools and machinery that you already know how to fit that model can apply here. And then you're kind of just bolting the change point stuff on top, okay? So if you know how to fit model one, model two, model three, model four independently, then you can fit this model. I'm gonna show you how to do that. So basically here, we're, we're saying we have some ordered change points that I'm going on here. I'm going to have m change points, but I don't know what m is. And what I'm saying here, this is just the, the maths of, of what was on this slide. We're saying for, for data points between here, I'm going to say that I have a cost here. And that could be, if I'm a statistician, that could be a likelihood. And um, it could be an entropy measure or any, anything else that you want here that just characterizes how your assumptions fit the data um, within that specific segment. Okay. And then I'm just summing that over all my different segments. So in my last slide, it'd be one, two, three, four, um, with three change points. And so I'm just summing that up here. And then I just want to find where, where are my change points? So where are my tau? So I'm taking the minimum of this. Okay. Um, 
Sadly, if you're using something like the, the likelihood and in, in a, a statistical setting, if you try and minimize this, you will get change points everywhere. Because the best way to fit this model is to have a different mean for every single data point, then your cost here is going to be zero, and then you're done. But that's not useful. So what we do is we um, assign this penalty value here, which I call beta, to try and create some parsimony within the model, to try and say, well, I don't really want a change point everywhere because that's not meaningful. Okay. So this is kind of controlling the, the, um, the um, parsimony, parsimony within the model. And so you can use lots of different things and just don't use the standard AIC because it's, it's um, open in the setting. So you can use SIC, BIC, um, Hanan Quinn and anything else you really want to put in here. You can do a lasso if you want, sorry, lasso, <laughs> uh, if you want, or some form of penalization factor. Okay. And so when I do this, what I can notice is that actually, if because I have additivity here, so model one doesn't interact with model two at all. So because I have additivity in my simple model, I can just write this as a sum up to the last change point here, and then add on the bit for my last change point. And so I, if I do that, I just have to split out my minimization over all the change points apart from the last one, and then I minimize over the last one separately. And the great thing is if we do that, you can then write that as this minimum here of what I understand from before and my last, and then I just get um, a minimization over one aspect because I can use all the information I've had previously here. So this is called dynamic programming, and it helps me basically start from the beginning of the data here, fit my models, and I'm always looking for where my last change point is prior to where I currently am, and I work from the beginning of the data to the end of the data. And so this part here has already been calculated at a previous step, and so this is order n squared because of every single, I have n of these uh, minimizations over my last change point location here, and I have to calculate this f of t n times. So, that's okay, that's better than two to the n minus one, different solutions, okay? But it's still n squared, it's still not that great. Okay? So what we did uh, in a paper in JASA back in 2012 with Paul Fernhead and Idris Eckley, both at Lancaster, um, is we kind of noticed that actually, if I'm at this point, capital T within my algorithm, and I'm looking backwards over all my previous locations, so if you remember this minimization here is over all previous, locations, then if I'm looking backwards, then this point here, little s, is a plausible candidate for where my last change point could be. But this little t really isn't, because my last change point is probably going to be somewhere around here. So once I've gone past the change point, there's no real point checking that anymore. So what we did was we came up with um, a a modification to the optimization algorithm, which allows us to have a condition that says, can we get rid of this little t? And if we can, we can get rid of it from all future um, um, settings. And so that gives us an order n algorithm instead of an order n squared. And suddenly you can fit these large models very, very quickly. And with the general framework of it's just model one, model two, model three, it becomes incredibly useful um, in terms of um, being able to fit loads of different types of change point models. So this has kind of been taken up by, by the community quite a bit, and we have R packages that, you know, you can fit lots of different types of models. And there's Python packages that people have made as well doing, using um, this algorithm. And so this order N kind of comes from the fact that when I do this, I'm only really keeping this stuff, you know, after the last change point. And so this, the size of this set here, what we can show theoretically is the size of this set is bounded. Uh, the bound doesn't relate to n, and so that's how you get from order n squared down to order n. But one of the key assumptions there is that the number of change points increases as you go through time. Because if you haven't seen a change point for a long time, then you're checking. The, the number of things you have to check is going to, to increase. So it's not a panacea for, for all applications. But often when we're working with um, this sort of um, environmental data, you will kind of see change points. Um, I want to say regularly, but at least over time. And so you are pruning a lot here. And so that can be helpful. So the key thing here is this just requires 
a way of characterizing how your model fits the data. Okay? So it's incredibly general. We do need this independence of parameters across the segments so that one doesn't and um, one model doesn't interact with another model, although you can actually say that the parameters from my current segment can rely on just the last segment and you don't lose much efficiency. Um, but going beyond more than one segment backwards, you start to lose a lot of efficiency in the algorithm. And so one of the key things um, that you're acquiring for this um, cost function here is just that adding a change point gives you a better fit to the data. Okay. So that's not always obvious for every single, so if you want to be Bayesian, it's not obvious in a Bayesian context. Um, and so you might need to do a little bit of work to, to get this to come out. So what this then means is that we don't have to worry about the change point part, we just have to worry about our model choice. So you're then back to what, what is the best model um, for the individual parts of my data. Perhaps you said this, but what does yeah. L stand for? Ah, I didn't say it. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I got asked that in my very first interview and my mind went blank. <laughs> so now I know it. <laughs> it's pruned exact linear time. So the idea is it's a pruning algorithm. Um, it's an exact solution. So we haven't done any approximation to the optimization at all. And then it's linear time um, for the fact that it's order n under a lot of settings. So I'll come back to the temperature data sets that we have. So the temperature application that I showed you earlier was just a single series, right? It's the global temperature series. But potentially you can go down to station levels and you might have hundreds or thousands of series that you might want to look at. There's no time to consider what model you might want to use for each of them. And so you might just have a class of models where generally speaking, temperatures may have um, just flat means, they may have trends, they may have autocorrelation, they may have some seasonality depending on what um, scale you're looking at. Um, and so the idea here is that the MCPT package, uh, which is available on CRAN, um, can allow you to just put hundreds or thousands of time series just into a single function that will decide the best model fit for you um, out of a pre-specified set of models that you want to consider. So that kind of gets rid of, on my very first page, all of these different mistakes that people tend to make. Um, if they use MCPT, then hopefully they won't make any of them, <laughs> provided that you know it, it gives a mathematical way of choosing the best model form out of all of those um, that you typically need for this sort of data. Um, so with that in mind, um, so MCPT does that for, um, uh, trends and um, autocorrelation. Um, it doesn't have seasonality, but if you know what you're doing with a computer, you can add seasonality in, um, but it's not there by default. Um, but there's a debate in, in the um, climate, uh, global temperature community about whether these trends should be continuous, so whether they should join at the change points, or whether they're allowed to be discontinuous. Um, I don't weigh in on that debate. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's also a debate over whether there's actually autocorrelation there at all. And if people believe there's autocorrelation, there's a debate over whether it actually changes over time or whether it should be fixed and constant. Okay. So, as I said, we were getting a bit fed up with all of this. There's a hiatus, there's a warming. So what we did was we basically took all of these different models. We didn't weigh into the debate over either of these. We just included all of the models in our assessment. And um, this was what the assessment was in 2018. We said there was just a trend, there was no autocorrelation coming through, there's no hiatus at the end. Um, and then this is what we've got in the current paper, which expands it to different uh, global temperature series. And in all of them, um, we are finding uh, this is the uh, joined approach and this is the unjoined approach. Um, this is with the changing AR structure, but the same um, change points occur whether you have a changing AR structure or a fixed AR structure. Um, and none of them get a, a check, uh, either an increased warming or a hiatus towards the end of the data. So the answer is, so far, mathematically, we cannot say whether there has been an increase or a hiatus in the warming of the plant. So what? So what? 
you're going to get a new measurement and everybody else is going to come back and they're going to say, oh, but that wasn't included in the new measurement. So we've now got a new measurement. And so now we believe it to be warming again. So we try to think, well, what can we do to try and stop that happening? Oh, I, sorry, I should say, um, before we go on to that, so you'll notice this one doesn't have autocorrelation that we fit here. This one does have autocorrelation. I just wanted to, because we're in a mathematical crowd, to say the, the um, difference between the trend and the trend with autocorrelation is was, but this was back in 2018, was extremely small. And so with the new data point, um, it has kind of pushed it so that the AR model is, is preferred to just the trend model. But we can debate over how close different models are um, at the break. Um, so, so what? So what? We didn't want people to come back to us and be, or be writing new editorials, which were claiming so just because they've got a new data point, all of our analysis is invalid now. So what we did was we, we kind of thought, well, how can we kind of give them at least a tool to be able to say, if you haven't got to this level yet, don't bother. Don't bother trying to make a claim whatsoever. So we kind of took the most favorable um, outcomes in terms of assuming that the future is going to be very similar to what we've seen in the recent past, etc. And so we're basically trying to be as conservative as possible here. And so we're saying that as you go forwards in time, so as you go from 2024 down here all the way up to 2040, um, and you're looking for change points all the way up until um, the current day here, what size of shift, so what is this surge magnitude to be able to be even thinking that there might be, mathematically speaking, something to say? And so I'm hoping that, number one, this will have lots of citations. <laughs> um, as, as hopefully some reviewers pick it up and go, no, I'm not looking at that paper because of this. Um, but maybe they won't get cited then because the papers won't get published. <sighs> Think about that. Anyway, <laughs> um, but the idea is to give people a tool. So people who are not necessarily mathematically minded, they can kind of look at this graph and they can say, okay, well, if I'm over here in, I'm looking at a change in 2010 and I'm up in 2040, then I need a change shift, a uh, surge magnitude of about 40, 45%. And if I, if it's anything less than that, don't even bother looking because these are the most favorable conditions of everything is, is kind of staying, staying as it is. Um, so if you, if you see a surge um, less than this, then you haven't even taken into account a bunch of uncertainties that you do need to take into account. So when you do, it's definitely not gonna be significant. So that was kind of us trying to give the community something that can temper this, um, bang and bust across the different sides, whether it will or not, I don't know. But there's certainly been some interest so far and it's not even been published. So um, yeah, it's, it's coming out soon. Um, it's on archive if you want to look today. So then I'm going to come back to, to trees. I'm conscious that we started early and, and I want to uh, move on, although I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this later on. So the I was talking about the trees earlier, the tolerance of trees is very, very important for planning aspects, both um, for the UK um, and generally worldwide about you know, what trees are good in certain scenarios. There's lots of things now with, with um, the urge to have more building of houses and things in different areas. Floodplains are getting de, de, de um, um, registered yeah thank you um, and so they're building on what previously were floodplains trying to put in protections for this and things like that and so if you plant certain trees in these in these areas that are not resistant to constant flooding and are just going to wither and die that's not helpful because that's going to have instability for the area it's a it's a hazard to the houses around them if they're, if they're large trees and they're going to grow and um, they, they might fall over and things and generally from a climate perspective, trees are, are incredibly important. And so you want to make sure that um, the things that you're um, doing are helpful for the, for the um, local environment. So they're very um, vital to the climate targets. And if we're going to have more droughts and more floodings, then we, we do want to know how our, our existing species are going, to, are going to react. We don't want to be watering trees 
that we know actually can tolerate a week of drought and be okay. Because that's a waste of resources as well. Although we don't tend to think much about that in the UK as they do in other parts of the, of the world yet. Um, but that, that is going to change. So as I, said, as I said, it's waterlogged for two weeks. I monitored afterwards. Um, generally, the paper that we're preparing is looking at differences across species, but I'm just going to talk about one um, and give you a, a taste of a second today. So you can imagine here that if we're, if we're looking at change points over time, and I'm, you know, if you look at this bottom series here, you can certainly see that something is going on here and something different is going on um, in this part and maybe some other differences here and later on. Okay, so you can see how change points might be able to give you an indication of what might be happening. And then the model that you're fitting can answer the research question, which is, what is the difference? So the change points are not, necessarily, are not answering, is there a difference? The change points are, set, are, are just there to tell you what periods of time are stable. And then the model that you're fitting within each one, is the, it, that's the model that's actually going to, to answer the research question for that specific period of time. So this one is a really obvious one. So you look here and you might think, oh yeah, you can see a difference here. Um, you, we've got the 95% confidence bands around. Um, and most of the time it's actually within the 95% confidence band. Okay. But what's important is the accumulation of being below that. Below that. That's what gives you the, the significance level here. And when you look at this, which is a, a QSUM chart, so it's cumulative sums of, of the differences here. Um, this is this is the track. It immediately, as soon as you go into the um, treatment phase, notices the difference. The difference kind of increases to get worse and then kind of stabilizes and then increases slightly. So you can have this um, QSIM chart, which uh, is an online version of the change point stuff that I've been talking about. Uh, you can imagine the dynamic programming when you're looking from the beginning to the end. You can use that in an online context. Uh, but I'm not going to talk to you about how specifically today, um, but then you can fit these piecewise um, linear um, settings. You, we can argue later about fitting curves and things instead, um, but for this, the piecewise linearity is very um, important in being able to characterize the response and the recovery phases. So um, we have you know, in a very severe immediate response and then this kind of stables off. So because this is parallel to, to the zero line, and um, this is where you've stabilized. So the treatment and control are behaving similarly. And this one here is, is when it's, the treatment is be behaving better. So the, the kind of science behind this is that during this phase, it's very stressed. The tree is stressed. Then it's relieved, okay? It's relieved when, when the reward is taken away. And then it kind of stabilizes and then it goes, oh, wait a minute, that could happen again. What do I need to do to, if that happens again, not be as stressed? Okay. And so it then puts out lots of new little roots. Um, that's the science, not proven yet. Um, and then that then means it can better use the water that's around it, which means it actually improves um, based off from the control later on. So you can kind of see this here, you've got it be you know, below. So it's, it's the sat flow uptake is below the, the standard one. It's not um, working as efficiently. And then over here, you start to get some that are above the control aspect where it's kind of it's working more efficiently than, than the controls would be that haven't been water locked. So that's an interesting thing for that species, just to prove that you know this isn't like a dramatic effect that might be due to model treatment. This is another species that I'm not going to show you the, the actual um, original plots, but you can see it, it actually works better. This is supposed to be a, a waterlogging tolerant species, and that it is. It works well during the waterlogging phase, and then there's literally more or less no difference. Uh, it's within the confidence bands for all of the recovery phase. So whilst this is a very, very obvious one, um, they're not all like that. So this is really helpful because the current um, understanding of whether trees are drought or, um, drought or waterlog resistant um, are just based off these spot measurements. And so they have no idea whether it's during the droughting phase uh, or the waterlogging phase that's the problem, or during the recovery is the problem. And um, they, they don't really have an understanding of what might be the issue. Um, and so for some of the species that we've looked at, they, they're very well under the water logging, 
but as soon as you give air back to them, they fall over and they die. So, you know, those, those are areas where you want to be planting those species, um, either, you know, where they're not going to get waterlogged at all, or where they're constantly underwater. So it's good learning for, for where um, different things are. So circling back to kind of sum up, so we've got time for questions. Um, appropriate mass available, as in techniques exist, does not mean that they're going to be used by the community. Um, and I think, you know, everybody in, in this room hopefully knows that, but it's not always said. Often people kind of just say, oh, well, we need this new mass. And then great, we've done the new mass, now what? How do we actually let people know that that new mass exists? And so for me, that means publishing in domain journals. And um, publishing in journals with climate scientists and, and, and other environmental scientists to actually get those techniques seeded in those communities. Um, and luckily, when, when they do that, sometimes it doesn't go well. Okay? Sometimes you submit a new uh, mathematical method to, to a journal and they go, oh, we don't like this because how do we know this maths is actually good? How do we know, you know, they don't have the reviewing pool to be able to do that. So personally, one of the things I do is, is I review for domain journals on a, on a like a two to one basis um, to make sure that, you know, they actually have the expertise in that reviewing pool so that you don't get a lot of rubbish from a mathematical perspective being published and reducing my frustration on the, on the other side as well. But what does help um, is available software. But you can't just put your software out there and go, yep, yeah, it's out there, great, they can use it. It has to be easy for them to use, okay? It can't be, you know, put this specific model in, have this, like, all of the terminology that I'm, I'm using is, is mathematical terminology, even down to function names, okay? Um, LM is, is <laughs> one of my big frustrations with that, with that. Like, a lot of people, unless you actually had a, a model, a modeling course or something, would not know what LM was. As a, as, a, as a concept to use. Anyway, um, easy to use, has good documentation and is findable. Like you can't just hide it like down on your website or, or in your um, supplementary material for your paper and um, it's on the journal website or something like that. Make it actually findable. And we get scared to do this because, you know, what if somebody uses that for something important? I was absolutely terrified when I found out that NASA were using the Pell algorithm for extravehicular walks for astronauts to keep them safe. I was absolutely terrified because <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> no, what if someone dies? You know? Um, so things like that, you know, we we often have this um inherent, oh, something bad could happen or or something like that. But why do I think something good could happen? Okay. If we put our stuff out there and people use it, they might find incredible things. They might find something that can actually help, you know, stave off um, climate change. They might be able to actually, you know, find out which techniques work and which ones don't much faster because they're actually using good mathematical grounding. And um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm of this, put it out there. And um, obviously you have to have some QA check before you do it, but generally, you know, don't feel it has to be perfect before you put stuff out. And one of the big things that I found is a lot of my stuff has been taken up because I've been willing to answer basic questions about it. Somebody emails me and says, I've used your stuff for this. Does it look okay? That takes a lot of my time, but because, I, because I'm willing to say, yeah, that's the right thing, or that looks okay, but have you thought about, and um, you know, pe people are actually using it more, I feel, because, you know, you're there to answer questions. So I'm going to summarize now. Sorry, we have time for questions. We did start earlier, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that I've kind of said um, stuff that makes you think, oh, this is kind of a bit interesting. Um, if not, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> but I really think that change, change points in time series are really crucial to environmental applications, especially with all of the new sensors that are coming on online. And um, you're getting a lot of people that are just doing spatial stuff previously. So the soil literature just used to really do a space survey and didn't really take time into account. Now we've got spatial <laughs> stuff going on. Um, so, but they do pose a challenge. 
because a lot of environmental scientists especially are so used to using their tried and tested methods and they want to use new stuff they're, they're quite excited but they're very hesitant because again they don't know what's right they don't know what's out there and it's completely unknown new world to them um, so reach out um, collaboration is a key here but one thing that I'm always careful about is that this isn't just a service to their community. We need to get something out of it as well. And I've been really, really lucky. So the long-term collaborations that I have are with people who understand that and who say to me regularly, Rebecca, what are you getting out of this? Okay. And luckily I can answer them and tell them. Um, but this is this is kind of the key because you do, I mean, unless you want to be the per, you know, some um somebody who does that kind of service, and that is wonderful if you are. But for me, I need something to keep my brain going. And it's not just solving the problem, it's it's creating the new math to solve the problem. So I need to know what new math do I need to create. Um so yeah, I would I would definitely say reach out um, but be careful. Um, and in this world, there are absolutely tons of different environmental applications and challenges to work on. Um, so if you're not out there already, which I presume most people in this room are, but if, if you're online and you're not, just find an environmental scientist and say, tell me about your data, and they will be absolutely thrilled to do so, because <laughs> it's like their little special interest. Um, with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Rebecca, for a fascinating talk and for introducing us to all these different applications uh, already of, of, of mathematics and in, in, uh, the environment. So, uh, yeah, so any questions for, for Rebecca? Thank you for your talk. Uh, you show some very ple pleasant examples of application of the change point analysis. Uh, you have you maybe understand, like, we high quality data, what you showed here. What about the application when we have a rare data? The data set has few points, like in paleo science, for example. How it works? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I successfully applied change point techniques to to even down to like ten data points. The key is always your signal to noise ratio in this sort of stuff. So you can have a small number of data points, but if you if you've got um small variants around them, then you can still use some change point techniques. Um, change points are not the be all and end all. Um, I, I work in, in a lot of different time series areas. So it could be that you'd be much better just having a time varying model instead of a change point model um, for that sort of data sets. Again, you've got challenges there in terms of number of parameters versus number of data points and things to fit. Um, yeah, not all data is nice. <laughs> um, Actually, the, the the trees data that I was showing that that is the original data. So that that's like, um, there were messy bits, there were missing bits in there. You know, I've not done anything um, to that other than some calibration across the different sensors. Um, so I agree that there is messy data out there in this, um, in this world. Um, but as with any kind of stuff, you need to try and pick the right techniques for the right sorts of questions and the right data sets that, that you have. Um, but small data doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use these techniques. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And thanks for a really great talk. Um, so um, I don't come from a stats background, so this might be a really silly question, in which case they don't care. But I just wondering, when you, um, your methods can like detect these change points, it, is there, do you ever put like uncertainty around or confidence intervals around them? I absolutely love that question. Um, that question was also asked um, in another session at JSM where um, <laughs> a colleague of, of, um, of mine from, from the US um, basically said, I always hate change point techniques because you don't get, you don't give the confidence bands around them. And um, I, was, I was sat in the audience, I was like, I'm really itching, really itching. And then the presenter said, who's my collaborator says, Rebecca, it just cannot keep still over there. It's clear that they want to say something. <laughs> and, um, so there are some techniques where you can do the, the confidence interval stuff. In the frequentist setting, they've been few and far between because it is incredibly challenging. 
Um, but I do have a paper that we're currently comparing that actually does that for, for PELT um, and other um, methods like, like um, dynamic programming based. So you can, but I haven't put it up there yet. <laughs> Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about the um, the tolerance of trees example. Oh, yeah. um, you mentioned that one of the things that you're monitoring is the interactions with other species um, after the trees were planted. I was just curious um, how, like, what types of interactions are you looking for, and are you using um, something else to sort of compare these interactions to, or? Yeah. Yeah. So for this, I'm not actually looking at interactions between the species. I'm just looking at the different species and trying to say this one is more tolerant, this one is less tolerant, or more specifically, this is the pattern of tolerance. Um, because they've basically got this current scale, which is not tolerant, mildly tolerant, highly tolerant, um, a nice traffic-like system. Um, but there's nuances in all of that in the sense of, as I said, it's about, you know, is it actually tolerant during during the waterlogging phase? Does it actually recover well afterwards um, or, or not? And does it actually, actually prosper? So we've had a few of the trees that actually do better than the control trees afterwards because they've got that um, better understanding of how to, how to take advantage of the water when it is there. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm maybe... Gave the wrong impression there. I'm not looking at interactions between the different trees, but that would be super interesting to do. Um, the, the trees that we were looking at here were kind of pot trees, so they're kind of like this big, not the ones where like the well-established trees that, that, that you would see um, out, out in, in you know along the street and stuff. Um, but having a, a wide range different makeup of trees in, in a specific area would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, because a, a follow-up question I was going to ask was um, if you could, uh, or if you thought about maybe like expanding to other, uh, like other types of uh, foliage and like forest areas and things like that. So not just trees, but like lower growth and things like that as well. Yeah. Um, so, but of course, like, I'm sure it's very complicated. Okay. Yeah. So we haven't. Um, the experiment that I showed was was literally a lab experiment. We've currently got, and um, well, we just got the. We're in the process of getting a third year of data with actually outside real life um, not controlled setting um, trees, um, which is really interesting because there we're looking more at growth. So that's with a, with a grower and we're looking at, well, actually, um, that's more about watering and conserving the water and um, aspects of when you water and when you don't, looking at size class for sales of trees um, as you go. So, you know, efficient water usage because the government has put legislation in place for how much um, water they can take out of the ground and things. So, yeah, yeah. so not quite, we haven't looked at the foliage. No. Uh, and there's a herbologist. I don't think he would be interested. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd have to say other people won't, so. How many different species did you look at in this? Um... For that one, and 10 different species. Yeah, 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 which is already the, a much larger data set. Normally, people don't look at one species. Yeah. I have a question from uh, Nick, who's watching online. I'm actually going to ask, uh, get him to speak it out yeah. loud. So just bear with me. Are you there, Nick? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rebecca. Thanks for a, a great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, change you. points is a really interesting and uh, subject that we deal with a lot up in uh, Scotland where, when we're working with our em environmental um, collaborators. I have three questions. Uh, the first two are sort of semi-technical. Um, yeah. So when you were talking about the shift from moving the algorithm from order n squared to order n, um, that change only really happens if there are many time points, right? So uh, many change points. If there are no change points in your series, then running it over your series will be n squared because you can't prune any data points. Is that right? So so we do still prune, but theoretically it would be order n squared, yes. Um, you do still prune because of the, the natural variation in, in what's happening. It doesn't just prune um, the, um, the kind of the, the middle 
Um, it doesn't just prune when you actually have a change point. It prunes when when it basically prunes the middle part of your data. Um, uh, you know, if if you have um, Let me start. Yes, is is the answer to your question. Um, it it will be more like order n squared. Yes, if you have no change points whatsoever. Um, um, so I like to say it's order ln, where l is the size of of the things that you keep, and so um, that's important. Uh, from, from that so in, in series with rare change points, it's it's likely to take a longer runtime. That's what I thought. Um, yes. It was yeah. also interesting that when you applied that to the temperature data set, I noticed if you could look at slide twenty four again, um, I noticed that when the models were constrained to be continuous, you had a different. Um, inflection point for yes. the different data sets, but that wasn't the case when the models were not constrained to be continuous. Yes, I wondered correct. if you, I wondered if you had thoughts on whether that tells you whether which one of these approaches is right or wrong or better than the others. <laughs> um, I, I would say that there is no right or wrong here. Um, it's all models are wrong, and so it's what we feel is the best representation for the for the data at hand. So. If this is um, looking at, um, I believe this is our yearly data I think we've got on this one. Um, so in the yearly data setting, I'm a person who believes that um, the climate is able to um, respond on a less than yearly time scale. And so I would argue that the um, in, uh, panel B where you have a discontinuous change point is plausible. Um, other people would argue that it's not plausible from a climate dynamics perspective, and so therefore panel A is better. Um, as a statistician, I, I kind of try and stay out of it a little bit, um, which is why we kind of allow for both. Um, prior to this paper, we couldn't actually do the AR setting with the join pin. So in the 2018 paper, we had to um, vehemently argue that we we should have the discontinuity but we've managed to get the ar stuff to work with the continuous trend and um, which is something that hasn't hadn't been done before um, so this allowed us to be able to put both panels on um, what i would say is that there are kind of it's more similar where the change point is in panel b across the series and um, in panel a you'll see that the actual inflection point varies across a few years um, as well. So it's, I mean, these are all different data sources and the way that they've been manipulated as well, I, I kind of have issue with how you, how you go from real observations to these series. Um, but I try and be a bit, I have to just live with the fact that they love this data, they love the data sets. And so I, I try and ignore all of those things. And um, because arguably the way that they've created the data would mean that you would have to have continuity as well. So, yeah. That's what I thought. Um, so my last question is not really a technical one. It was a comment on the um, or a question about the maintenance of software and making yeah. the tools <laughs> open and available. So yeah. um, my original background was astrophysics, where oh. everything is open and available because there's no money, um, uh, because there's no real impact. We can't go stars. Um, I moved to bioinformatics and there there are lots of open source tools um, that people make available and now I'm doing environmental science where there's also a lot of these um, but there's a lot of um, hand wringing I want to say about the um, time sink of maintaining software that yeah. we make publicly available and of answering questions particularly if your package happens to become popular and I've released a few packages over these um, different areas and with with different levels of commitment there. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you handle that uh, time sink, uh, handle the concern about the time sink, and how do you justify it to your administrators and management, given that it presumably is not costed? Yes. <laughs> this is a something that I think generally as, as a field of, of mathematics, we should be trying to address. Um, I, I think part of, part of, okay, I'm, I'm aware this is, <laughs> um, part of this is around, um, I think part of it is around ownership. So 
there's this sense of, um, you know, software is often created by PhD students and junior researchers. Um, I mean, it can be created by anybody, but a lot of a lot of the software in mathematics is is created by PhD students and junior researchers, and it is a huge undertaking for them to be able to devote a lot of their early career to maintenance of these things for stuff that is detrimental to their career. Um, because the time that you spend for that is is taken away from the time that you may may be encouraged to being spent on other more promotionable um, activities. So I certainly believe that there's a problem and I don't know what the solution is, but I think part of it is ownership of um, who who actually owns and is responsible for this for the for the software that we create? Is it us as individuals? Is it our institutions that we create it under? Is it the mathematics community as a whole? Um, and it's incredibly difficult. I I really positively recognise the move towards um, research software engineers as as a um, institutional thing that a lot of um, universities have. Um, if you if you're in a company and some you know a mathematician creates a bit of software, it then gets sent to the software developers and the software developers kind of develop it and things going forward. So, you know, I think there is some kind of semblance of trying to move towards that sort of model um, in universities where you might get academics who create prototype bits of software that then get sent to the research software engineers who are kind of responsible for developing that. But then you have to choose not all bits of, you know, everybody has limited time, not all bits of software are equally um, obviously useful um, immediately. And um, it takes time. And I fully agree with you in terms of the, the amount of maintenance time for a lot of these things. And um, what I would say is I have been incredibly lucky um, in the sense that the actual maintenance of the software that I put out there is very little. And for me, it is more about um, the interactions with people who use it, which for me is the joyous part. Um, so a lot of the software that I put out there, I purposefully made incredibly um, standalone so that it doesn't actually depend on a lot of other packages uh, inside the R or, or Python um, setup. And so that has meant that I have had very little maintenance over I managed to get to 10 years of, of the change point package with only one email from Brian Ripley, which I was, that is my badge of honor. <laughs> um, I've had three, it's, you know, I, I think I had three in the subsequent three years, but um, it, it would, you know, that is a big thing for a lot of people, especially when you yeah. want to be open source and you want to put your stuff out there. I mean, I think that's a really in insightful answer. Oh. Um, I, I struggle a little bit with it, though, because um, I think it's really clear who the ownership is in of the software in most cases. You know, we when we create something and we're employed by our, our employer or our university, the university owns that piece of software. They own our intellectual property. We might be able to release it in an open way. But then often if you come to leave, I'm not sure there are very many universities that will embrace the idea of maintaining that software once you've left. Um, even though they have ownership of it. And I think even even worse, if research, the move to research software engineers is an excellent one, but we have to fund those as well. And so it really relies on some of us more senior folks who might be able to input into things like funding panels to really try and motivate long-term plans for software, software maintenance, include them in grant applications and fund those projects appropriately but then of course that takes funding away from elsewhere because funding is stressed yeah I, I fully agree and e even if you put into a grant and um, you know a research software engineer for being able to help you create that software and you try and have a longevity for that piece of software and um, ultimately that grant ends the funding ends at that point and you you know there isn't funding as far as i'm aware for just maintenance there, there was for, um, you know, there's always funding for developing new stuff and putting things, new stuff into into things. Um, but I looked, at, I looked to physics in that 
setting. So physics has um, this kind of block grant structure for specific large and um, large things like the Large Hadron Collider and, and other large experiments where, you know, they have block grant structures for that. Maybe we should have a block grant structure for software. And then everybody bids into that. And then you have to justify why your software should be maintained versus some other people's software. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I agree with you in the sense that it, it is a problem um, and it's a crunch point we're going to be coming to. Um, you know, you can't, you can't have large scale things um, and important pieces of infrastructure based on software that is not maintained. Um, and that's, that's why a lot of companies won't use open source software as a, as a point of view. Sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe in the interest of, of yeah. time, maybe we should. Uh, leave, uh, I think. One more question oh, okay. from the other members. Anyone else here? We've got a couple of minutes left. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Question um, I'm reading on their behalf. It's from Umesh Kord at Johns Hopkins University. Sometimes people use fisher information, FI, to track changes. Do you think FI could be a good technique to use with the long term climate, climate slash temperature change time series? Um, so by fishes information, do, do they mean just like the standard statistical fishes information or is that, because this is one of the other problems is, is that um, you have different terminology for the same thing, or the same terminology meaning different things. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're talking about statistical fishes information, then yes, you are able to, to use that to monitor um, things longer term. It's more, again, behind that, you'll need to have a, a specific model form that, that you're thinking about to calculate the fishes information on. Um, but in, in essence, a lot of what we're doing here is, is about, if you, if you think about when you, you're thinking about changes in structure, you're looking at distribution, then you've got another distribution for a different period of time. And it's about how much those distributions overlap and that di is directly related to the fishes information. Well, I think, um, thank you very much, Rebecca, for a brilliant talk and for answering all these questions. <laughs> <laughs>